Thank you, Dr. Kagawa Singer. Um, that was uh, very interesting, very challenging. <laughs> uh, that, that, but, uh, you know, uh, you, you have really highlighted some of the challenges that the committee has been facing when we uh, discussed a number of these interventions, uh, the role of culture and how do we define it and how do we measure it and how do we accommodate and account for it in, in the interventions. So I will start off with uh, one question and then uh, others uh, can jump in and there will be other questions from the committee. Uh, a, a colleague of mine uh, who just died, a, a brilliant guy called Fred Lee, uh, whom you know very well, we know each other. Fred, uh, who was the, um, who discovered uh, the Lee from any syndrome in cancer, um, uh, once joked that, uh, you know, his dream was um, always to open a Chinese kosher restaurant, you know, so, <laughs> Uh, you know, so, uh, and I was thinking of it when you showed the slide on burrito, on the burrito, I think. And, on the, um, and, and so the, my question is, when we talk about culture and talk about parenting, we talk about it in terms of, of, of very clearly defined boundaries, okay? It is Japanese culture, Indian American culture, or, or, or Hmong culture, but, Contemporary parenting is about negotiating and navigating across cultures, right? So, uh, so you raise kids in a one way at home with one sense of values, but you're also trying to get them ready uh, because they are going to be in a very different culture. And I'm, I'm wondering if you want to speak to that a little bit in this notion of navigation of culture. It's just not one culture, you know, given the contemporary society we're talking about you know, cultural or cultures with very porous boundaries. The porous boundaries, I'd like, I'll start with that one because I think in most other cultures that are very community oriented, um, where self is not primary, but the group welfare is, I term that uh, porous ego boundaries, which is quite contrary to Western <laughs> ideas of, of self. And having to navigate those different cultures does require a lot of, one, experience, but two, <coughs> education in understanding that there's not just one right way. And that's when it becomes really exciting, is that what's right for, the, for that particular situation um, and community. I asked the kids in school, I said, do you act the same way with your parents as you do with your friends, as you do as a student? And one of my Latina students raised her hand. She said she was studying for her doctoral qualifying exams and in a school, not public health. And she said her friends in the study group were joking with her, oh, we can't wait until you get back to normal. You know, because she was starting to get, it was getting really close. She was getting more anxious. She was just losing it and, or getting extremely demonstrative about her anxiety. <laughs> and, she said it was like cold water hitting her in the face. She said, wait, wait. You don't realize that this is normal. This is me. Do you realize how hard it is to act white every day? And I think that as you get more education, you learn how to navigate those different roles. If you're an immigrant raising children, that's what we see in the youth is a lot of problems because they're hearing one thing at home, they're learning another thing in school, and they don't understand that both are right. You just have to learn just like learning another language, which is appropriate in which setting. And so I think that the porous boundaries of multicultural, especially in Los Angeles, you said in Kansas there are 40 languages. We have 250. So I, you know, I just, my hat's off to the teachers here in California. When you have that many differences, one of the teachers, one of the mothers that I work with in the Korean community said that her teacher called her in for a parent-teacher conference because she was concerned about her child's self-esteem because whenever she talked to him, he was eight, he would never look at her. He'd only look at the floor. And she was mortified. She said, I taught him to do that because you don't talk to a person in authority and look them in the face. You know, so she was teaching her child to be appropriate, and he was being misread. 
as having low self-esteem. So it's those kinds of cues, if they're constant and even just small all the time, not perhaps as, as noticeable, at least with, for the teacher, those are going to add up to problems of, of self-esteem or a sense of integrity in being able to and hinder the ability to navigate. So. Thank you. From the committee, any of the committee members have questions? Natasha? Go ahead. Yes, yeah. no. I'm the first one, <laughs> so I will take long. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> and who are you, Natasha? <laughs> who am I? Who am I? Good question. <laughs> I am a person, a mother, I'm Natasha Cabrera. I'm a University of Maryland, and I study low-income families. Um, fascinating um, talk. Thank you so much for the cultural piece. It's so hard to, you know, I teach a culture and development class to my students, and the first time they want to know is, like, just what is it, and then describe it, then move, measure it, and then move on. And like you said, it's just much more than what is culture, so many things. But I was curious about, there's some, studying culture in, in the US is very difficult because often we kind of confound ethnicity and culture and everything else. So, and then we have these small studies and then we generalize to large groups. What I, I didn't get from your presentation is the variability within cultural groups. Not every Latina person is the same, not every Asian person is the same, and so on. So, so in, the, in, in the midst of doing some good, we also tend to homogenize these this communities. And they're very complex. When I talk to a Latina mom saying, um, one of my studies, they say, you know, there's some very nice things that Americans' parents do that I want my kid to learn. I don't want him to be so dependent. I want him to be independent. I came here so he can be successful here. But I also want them to love my family, to love me, not to be, you know. So they're very thoughtful and um, conscientious about the goals and the beliefs that they want the children to learn from both cultures. So I feel like immigrating here gives them the opportunity to choose and select and make up something that I'm calling bisocial, bicultural, bilingual. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, whether you see this variability within cultures and what does it mean for the kids and the parents, you know, I mean, I hear the same thing from the parents saying, I taught my kid not to, not to, um, you know, question the teacher. But the child has learned that at school, he has to question the teacher. So now we have a child that knows, don't question mom, question teacher. You know, so I think that's the bicultural adaptation that we may be getting at. So I wonder if you can comment a little bit on all that. Uh, I just echo what you say. Uh, you just have to read that 300 plus page tome. Uh, uh, but the, the, variability within any group has to be attended to because it isn't uniform and that's one of the fallacies about it it's there is homogeneity and there isn't uh, within a, what i term is you know the the five ethnic groups racial ethnic categories on the omb omb devised that for uh, it's the omb it's budget it's money <laughs> Uh, it was designed in 1972 to track the civil uh, progress on the Civil Rights Act. Were there loans, housing, those kinds of things? That's why it's there. Somehow it got adopted in medicine. The physicians here maybe can tell me why. Um, as though there's some reified reason for doing that when you don't understand who the person is informed by their culture. And the, the variations, I mean, I live in Los Angeles. We have Cubanos, we have Mexicans, we have Colombians. You know, they're from all over. Each one is different. And then we have, uh, I have a Latina, used to be a staff member. She works in D.C. now. And she says, I, I really have a problem when they say, what generation are you? She said, one grandmother is from Mexico, so that's close. I can do that one. But my other grandmother was here before it was California. You know, what do I do with that? And for the native peoples that I work with, that's a huge issue. You know, Columbus did not discover America. So th those are the kinds of, of tensions that happen and families who are going through the, the dynamic aspect of it. I, I, the analogy I use is what is your carry-on luggage versus this was before you had to pay so much. Um, but for your check luggage or your carry-on, and usually your carry-on are those things you really don't want to lose because the luggage usually gets lost. So your parents pack you that initial suitcase. And as you go through your life, you start changing and picking and choosing, so you're no longer exactly what you know, your parents were. 
nor anyone else in your community because you have your own life experiences. So the individual aspects of it are, are important. The culture informs it, but the questioning then becomes for any community is how much of it is essential to you and how much you know, are you willing to give for something else. So the replacement behavior or belief has to be of more value than what they're giving up or how to put the two together. Kim. Kim Bowler from the committee. Um, I'm interested in what you were bringing up about weird theory and weird science. And the committee is grappling a lot with these issues with regard to um, you know, sort of the roots of developmental theory and parenting theory and practice. And kind of thinking about the progress we have made over the last 15 or 20 years in big science, for example. So some of the data that we looked at this morning from the national surveys, the SIP and, and CPS, and from the large impact studies, the Head Start impact study, the early Head Start study, the descriptive studies of Head Start, and so on. When you think about those kinds of projects where we really do have nationally representative surveys of um, large programs that have uh, very large and diverse samples. When you think about those, Marjorie, what do you, re what do you think about um, the lenses that we are bringing to those data, the kinds of, you know, we're no longer talking about the college, you know, samples of convenience that we used to, and those moms who are able to bring babies to the labs and so on. So, so are you seeing progress and, and you know, what, 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 what's your take on the recommendations that you would say now that we have a whole lot of data that really are representative of a lot of different backgrounds and cultures, and um, what are the cautions or um, concerns that you have? I mean, I, for me personally, it's that we don't, we still don't have a lot of scientists that represent the cultures in our country, um, and so on. But I'd, I'm interested to hear what you have to say to the committee about it. Uh, we're making a lot of progress, I think, in, in making the study samples more representative but we still have a long way to go. Um, like on the ad health data, it's not disaggregated. Right? So if you have those of, if you have African Americans, I think is the category, are those African nationals? Are they African Americans? Um, and then all the variation within that population and geographic differences. Uh, I had a Californian African American marrying an African American man from Georgia, and she said, "Oh my God, it would have been easier to marry an Asian." They're so, the, the two cultures are so different. She said, "I'm having a really hard time." So, are we taking those things into account on the sampling strategies for these large cases? If you're sampling kids in school, at least they're English speaking. If you're sampling their parents, how many languages is, is it translated into? You know, and at which level? Uh, most of the in healthcare, most of the drug company translated things are unusable in the communities. I work in low-income monolingual populations. They just, they just said toss it, you know. So a lot of money is being wasted and not providing services. I mean, that's a whole another tale. But how do we then get, um, and the questions often that are being asked when you analyze it by education level, if I have um, a student who gets a 12th grade education in South LA versus a 12th grade education in a public school in Beverly Hills, they're not comparable. And yet, in an analysis, I'd put them into the same. So I think we really have to rethink the science that we do and how we label and group groups for analysis that, and whose voices are actually being represented in those surveys. Right. Um, we have time for just one last question, and then. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Brennan, Thank you. 
The integrity part, I'm trying to think of the one minute time. <laughs> uh, the integrity part, let me just, with an example, a personal example. I'm married to a German Jew. I'm Japanese American. I understand child abuse as a parent because you get pushed to the limits. And hopefully with education and a little bit of, of self-awareness, you know, you know where the boundaries are. But with both of my kids who were 18 months apart, I did the same thing at about the same age when they were maybe five, six. With my son, I set him outside the front door and I said, you cannot come into the house until you can follow the rule, you know, when you're ranting and raving and it makes no logical sense, but it made me feel better. When my husband got to that point with the kids, he would say, go to your room and you can't come out until I tell you to. Thankfully, a Japanese anthropologist was describing child rearing practices. And he noted that for the Japanese, the ultimate goal of a good person is to be a member of the inner house. For the Western view, when you're 18, you're independent, you fly the coop, right? So you're teaching independence. So the punishment for both as children was towards that end. Mine was to exclude him from the house. His was to not let the kid go out. I told them, well, the psychiatrist can handle that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but then understanding why parents do what they do is, is an implicit. I had no conscious awareness of it until it was pointed out in the article. I go, oh my god, yeah. So even though I was my parents, I'm third generation in this country, I still had that in my head. And it was an automatic response with no conscious thought. And how do you capture that part of it unless you know what the endpoints are? And then how do you educate and weave, you know, multiple right ways of doing things into that ultimate outcome as this committee is charged with doing? Thank you, Marjorie.